Hi, I'm Patrick Flaherty with BagMass.com, the only anesthesia professional career site built for providers like yourself, where you can find career navigation articles, the latest jobs, scholarship news, and webinars. So we're living in some pretty unprecedented times now. There's lots going on. And uh, one of the things that we're seeing that's really weird is there's certain parts of the country where people in healthcare are just busting their asses. They're taking care of COVID patients, working a lot. And in other parts, people have lost their jobs. They've been furloughed. They've had their hours reduced, the pay cut. And there's left a lot of questions about how that affects your contracts. You know, is some of this stuff valid? So we're very fortunate today. We have Erica Adler from Retzel Law Firm, who's a contract lawyer specialist. She's been helping her clients the past two weeks, looking over all sorts of different issues they have. And she's here today to share some of the stuff that she's seen that we can use to better prevent or at least understand what our rights are. Erica, I'd like to welcome you. Thanks so much. And it's really great to be here with you guys today. Um, as Patrick just mentioned, what we've seen over the past month or so has been really unprecedented. At first, we didn't know exactly how this would impact physicians generally, but it turned out we have a pretty good idea of what's going on right now and the trend to continue. So for physicians that are out there, uh, whether they're contracted or employed, one of the things we're seeing is that there are financial hardships that are being suffered by employers. And unfortunately, Physicians are impacted if their employers are not doing well. Uh, sometimes this is done in a fair manner and sometimes it isn't. So what I really want to talk about today is to understand what it means when you have a contract. Understand what your employer can and can't do. Think about what you're willing to do with or for your employer or what you absolutely cannot accept. And I think it's important to understand that there's no really right solution. Different physicians are in a different position. Uh, whether they can uh, accept a pay loss, um, whether they can go a long period of time without a paycheck, uh, and there's all different options. So there's no one right answer. You have to figure out what your rights are and what the right answer is for you. So first I wanted to just kind of start out by explaining what some of the basic provisions are or the types of employment that you might see in your contract. So first of all, employee at will is generally somebody, and, and most states have employment at will contracts. Uh, and employment at will would be somebody who could just be terminated without any kind of notice. That's generally not the physician. I can't think of one physician that I've ever worked with who did not have a written contract. However, the receptionists in the office, uh, some of the techs in the office, they may not have a written contract and they may fall under employment at will, which would mean that no particular amount of notice is owed to them. They don't have a contract that we need to refer to. So at will is very different than having a contract. Now, keep in mind that some employers rely very heavily on policies. So just because you don't have a contract, you may still have some policies. But the general concept is that if you're an employee at will, you can be let go immediately, no reason needed. And if you're a contracted individual, then you have certain rights that are described in that contract. And that's kind of the basis of what we're going to talk about. Contracted employee generally is presented with a contract that will have certain provisions in it. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. But some of the key provisions that apply here are usually a start date, whether the contract has an end date, how the contract can be renewed, and then in the middle of that time period, how a contract can be modified and how a contract can be terminated. And those are really the essential provisions here that we're going to talk about. So if any of you have your contract handy or have recently looked at your contract, those would be the type of provisions that are going to be most pertinent to our discussion today. So some of you may have heard about the layoffs that are going on. Perhaps you yourself have been laid off. There's no exact definition for a layoff. Essentially, a termination is a layoff. So if you have been laid off and your employer tried to couch it as something other than a termination, we need to really think about that. You can only be terminated or laid off in accordance with your contract. And if another approach is taken, this can be a breach of your contract. So laying somebody off and terminating somebody are, are fairly identical in terms of terminology. And then finally, furlough. And I think a lot of people are just not really familiar with the term furlough until recently. 
essentially furlough means, and, and again, this is a term of art, there's no actual definition, and some people will explain it differently than others, but furlough is supposed to be you're employed, but you're not getting paid. Um, it, it's kind of an oxymoron in a way. It allows you to go and apply for unemployment, but you still may be getting your benefits. And a furlough is used when the employer has the intent to bring you back when the employer can. So in this situation here where we're having this COVID uh, pandemic that's going on, a lot of employers have laid people up with the intent to bring them back when this is over. The idea is that the employees can go and collect unemployment. They still may be getting their benefits. And uh, the idea that everyone has is they'll be brought back when things go back to normal. However, if your contract does not allow you to be furloughed, does not allow the employer to stop paying you what they owe you and stop giving you other things that are in your contract, a furlough is most likely a breach of your contract as well. So when we think about any kind of interruption in the obligations of the employer to the employee, we're thinking about a breach of contract. And again, a furlough and a layoff can be those kinds of breaches. So hopefully everybody's kept following along and you can see where I'm headed with this. So as I've been approached by many uh, physicians around the country, uh, a lot of them have had different types of experiences. So some employers are sending out just a, uh, a big memorandum to everybody or an employee saying, hey, guess what? We're, we're really sorry, but everybody's taking a 20% cut across the board. Or guess what? We're reducing all your hours. Um, guess what? We're getting rid of the bonus target, et cetera. So some people are doing it through what I'll call a, a general memorandum. Now, it's important to note that in your contract, every contract out there has a provision in it that says this agreement can only be amended by agreement of the parties in writing. So if you have something like that, your contract cannot be amended unless you and the employer have signed something in writing. Not all contracts have that, but most of them do. And so if you're suddenly just given a notification, hey, guess what? We're cutting your compensation in half. That, again, does not affect your contract and would also be a breach. We're changing your hours. We're changing your schedule. We're changing your location. All of these things can possibly be a breach of your contract. So it's important to know what your contract says and whether your contract can be modified unilaterally. So that's some of the, uh, one of the approaches, at least, that we're seeing. In other instances, we're seeing employers give employees written amendments to their contracts. So in that case, uh, employers are either talking to their counsel or they realize the proper way to do things and they're uh, presenting written amendments to the physicians to look at. Um, sometimes these amendments are well done and sometimes they're not. Uh, what you see on your screen right now, hopefully, is a list of some of those typical amendments that I see. It might be a change to your schedule. I just spoke with a doctor today and his schedule was changed from four days a week to one day a week. They didn't change his hourly rate. But sometimes I see changes to per diem rates, base salary. They had a doctor who was cut from 300,000 to 150,000 annualized salary. Um, if you're on production, the situation is a little bit more dire. The employer likely doesn't need to do much of anything because you know 40% of, of nothing is nothing. So uh, production is a full effort. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So schedule, location, compensation, bonus targets, these are the kind of things I'm seeing modified. Some of the issues with these written amendments, though, are that they simply modify the provisions that the employer is interested in, changing your schedule, changing your compensation. But very often, there's no end date, which can be difficult because nobody knows when this is actually going to be over. Um, so all we can do is try and work with the employer to see if we can improve the amendment. So some of the ideas that I like to use in terms of improving the amendment would be to say, okay, but no later than X date, so maybe June 30th, uh, July 15th, some kind of you know finite date. So we know when we will go back to normal. Of course, this doesn't work for everyone because some people are, and rightly so, saying, hey, we don't know when this is going to be over. And even if it's over, it can take time to ramp up. So what else can we do to kind of put an end to this? Because if there is no end, you have just permanently modified your compensation, your schedule, and whatever else you've agreed to. Now, most of the amendments I've seen have some kind of vague language like, when things improve, we'll put you 
back where you were. But once you've amended your agreement, there is no obligation other than you know good faith and goodwill for the employer to actually return you to where you were. So what I like to think about are some objective ways that we can achieve this. Maybe by saying when there's a certain number of patients on the schedule, the certain number of elective surgeries are scheduled. Depending on what type of workplace you're in, the answer might be different. But a lot of times it can be tied to some objective factors. And this is something to think about to give you a little bit more control over the situation. Your employer may or may not agree to that, but it's something to think about. Another concern is what about the lost income? So if you are generally receiving a base salary of $300,000 and you've agreed to take a cut and you're down at 150 and several months go by, and then you're returned to your original salary, what about that lost income? Is it just something that you give up as your contribution to whatever has occurred here? Are there opportunities to get that money back? Uh, that's something as well that you could talk about with your employer. Um, a lot of practices, a lot of hospitals, a lot of surgery centers are in a position to um, receive some very forgivable funding out there, whether through uh, Health and Human Services, through uh, the PPP loans that are available. So, you know, whether the employer is really in dire straits or not, or whether they will be at the time that you're back at work is it, something that remains to be seen. I, I like to try and get my doctors back to where they were and get them their lost income. Another issue to think about is once you've modified your compensation, what happens if you are then terminated without cause of your contract? So you've agreed to lower your salary from 300,000 to 150,000. You're then given a 60 day notice of termination without cause. That would mean that for the next 60 days, whether you work or not, your employer owes you your salary for that period. But you've just agreed to lower it to $150,000 from $300,000. If you're smart, what you would ask for is to say, if you let me go without cause before this amendment goes back uh, to the way it was before, then you pay me at my full rate. It's a great idea. Whether an employer will buy into it or not, I don't know. I find that most employers who really do have the true intent to bring their doctors back will agree to this. But again, some of them are just sending out form amendments and aren't willing to discuss any type of changes. Still, it's something to think about. Uh, for example, I was speaking with a physician this morning who was reduced from four days a week to one day a week. And if he's given notice of termination, that would affect him by approximately $3,000 for a night uh, per week for a 90 day period. So you can see how this adds up very quickly uh, to really be meaningful money that we're talking about. Some physicians like to see some other changes. You might like to uh, have any amounts that they might owe forgiven, so signing bonuses, uh, relocation amounts that they were given in exchange for agreeing to the amendment. Um, other doctors are looking for certain commitments that they can't then be terminated without cause for a period of time for a whole year, for example, once they return uh, to work. Um, so there's little nuances that might be impacted by your personal concerns and your personal contract. You'll see on this list, one of the items I've listed is exclusivity. And the reason I mentioned that is where you've had your schedule cut down or you've had your compensation lowered, some physicians really need the money that they were earning. Actually, most who doesn't need the money that they're earning. So the idea would be to get a carve out to your non-compete or your exclusivity provision so that you could in fact work elsewhere uh, if you could find a position uh, while this contract was in place. And then obviously to take it even further, I, I would always try and argue for a complete release from a non-compete if possible. So you can see how these things fit together. One other thing I'll just mention about location is that I have had some physicians be assigned to work at a location um, other than one that they're very comfortable working in. Um, maybe it's from outpatient to hospital-based work. If your contract says that you must work where assigned by the employer, then you may have no choice regardless of how uncomfortable you are. If this is a change that your contract does not allow, then you certainly have a good argument. This is one of the really important reasons why we like to negotiate a contract before it's signed when possible. So what I have on this slide here is a good example of what type of language you might see uh, in a contract. The first segment 
It says, this agreement supersedes all previous contracts or agreements between the parties with respect to the same subject matter and constitutes the entire agreement between the parties. This agreement may be amended only by an instrument in writing signed by both parties here too. This is the language I was referring to where we really need both parties to agree to any amendment to the contract for it to be binding. And if somebody tries to force a change and it's not acceptable to the other party, that would in fact be a breach of contract. On the other hand, I want to point out, and I looked at a contract like this this morning, some employers are pretty savvy. And I would say uh, the large hospital systems and some academic institutions in particular do give themselves the unilateral right to modify certain provisions in a contract. You'll see the sample language on the bottom. It says, X may revise or adjust physicians' compensation from time to time during the term of this agreement upon prior written notice. So in this case here, you don't need consent. You don't need anything in writing. The doctor's just given notice of a change. So I have actually seen several instances of this. So this would be a situation where a memo going out to everybody would likely be sufficient. One other thing I want to warn about is that I have seen some physicians being told that they're going to be terminated if they don't sign an amendment. This is a rather unfair approach. Most contracts don't allow termination for not signing a contract. So it's important to understand what basis is the employer saying this. I've had some doctors who've had some trumped up termination for cause arguments made so that they could be forced to sign an amendment. I've had doctors who have refused to sign an amendment only to find themselves terminated for cause where the employer didn't follow the contract at all. A lot of contracts either require that you say why you're terminating somebody for cause. In many instances, they have a right, the doctor has a right to try and cure the issue. But just to say you're fired for cause without giving a reason is really not fair. And that is an instance where you should be talking to a lawyer if you have no idea uh, why the termination occurred. It's important to note that the differences between being terminated for cause and terminated without cause can be significant. Many times a contract will say that if you're let go without cause, perhaps the employer is responsible for the tail, or perhaps you're released from the non-compete. You don't have to pay back certain amounts. So the distinction between whether something is for cause or without cause can be important. Another important thing to note is that when you're terminated for cause, there's no notice period. The employer gets out of having to pay you during that notice period. Perhaps the employer realizes that what they're doing is not entirely kosher, and maybe you'll have a claim against them. But I think there is a, a strategic decision being made here. Will you take the time to find a lawyer? Will you spend the money to seek damages from them? Sometimes it's a cost-benefit analysis. They're willing to take the chance that they can pay you some money if a lawyer gets involved to make you go away, but no matter what, it'll probably be less than if they fully honored the contract. So that's somewhat of a game that the employer will play, and it's important to understand what the motivation behind that could be. All right, so here, just to go into a little bit more detail, are some termination for cause provisions you might see in your contract. Specific reasons like a license, free, a license loss, a DEA, a breach of your contract, death, disability, bankruptcy, uh, fraud or gross negligence. And then sometimes there's some subjective provisions, you know, things like you did something to impair the reputation of the employer. We're really seeing those kind of provisions used these days where employees are complaining about whether an employer has provided PPE uh, or other safety precautions to protect their employees. So, um, you know, where you hear on the news, they were wrongly terminated. In fact, speaking out or saying something disparaging uh, about your employer, doing something to hurt their reputation might in fact be a breach of contract. On the other hand, perhaps the employer did also violate some OSHA requirements, but that's a different issue altogether. Um, now termination without cause, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, is essentially when you're just told that you're being terminated and usually there's some period of time tied to it. The employer can either let you work or not let you work, but they do owe you for that period. Standard provisions are 30 to 120 days. So you can look at your contract and see what is required there. Um, finally, I want to mention this last provision. You may have heard some talk about it in the news. It's called a force majeure. 
um, or a termination for impracticability. So basically, a force majeure provision is something you don't really find in a position contract. I've yet to find one uh, in any contract, and I've reviewed thousands of them. Uh, it really is, is seen more and more commercial contracts where you might have an act of war, an act of God, or some other type of reason where somebody can get out of a contract because it's impossible for them to perform. Um, and then under common law, we have more um, the, the common law doctrine of impracticability, where it's impossible for somebody to perform their obligations under the contract. There's a very, very high standard in the courts before anybody could argue that they could not perform under their contract because it was impossible. We're really not seeing that as a viable claim right now. Uh, it hasn't been long enough. There's many people in the same situation who are managing to stay in business and pay their employees. Uh, there are loans available out there. So I think right now it's really early for somebody to try and make that argument. I have had a couple of physicians terminated on this basis, and we have uh, obviously gotten into a dispute with the employer about whether there's grounds for that. In both cases, we have managed to enter into a settlement because I think what the employer did was assume that the employee would buy into it or not know any better. But I think if you're talking with legal counsel, they should be able to advise you that you can't buy that argument. So what I really want to talk about here, and you'll see on this slide I've, some other things I've already mentioned, um, how your contract termination can impact your non-compete, uh, tail, repayment of a bonus, et cetera. What I want to really talk about here now is what is the right thing for you to do when this happens to you? There is no one solution. A lot of young physicians uh, like their job. They want to keep working there. Uh, they've been told they're taking a 20% pay cut. A lot of them will just go along with it. Uh, they have good faith that the employer will treat them the same way as everybody else. Not every situation needs to turn into a battle. If you want this job, then you want to make sure that you're not uh, you know, winning the battle but losing the war. Because I assume that if you're refusing to accept something that everybody else has accepted and it was not necessarily unreasonable, then you might impact your future relationship with your employer. Another thing to think about is that, at least where I represent a lot of healthcare uh, employers, most of them will do the right thing and go and talk to the employee first, and they'll try and work something out. If they're unable to work something out, and we have had some doctors who are unwilling to make any changes to their contract to accommodate the situation, even though perhaps the shareholders in a practice might not be taking any compensation at all right now. So if, if the doctor is unwilling to do anything, then the employer really is in a hard place as well. The doctors are in a hard place if the employer does something, but the employers are in a hard place as well. So typically um, what we've recommended there is that the employer first try and work something out. And if they cannot, that they give that notice of termination without cause. They pay the doctor what is owed under the contract for the full notice period with the hope that during that notice period, some other agreement can be reached. So I think it's important to understand that there are two sides to this, that everybody can either be a winner or a loser here, and that COVID is an unusual situation and there's going to have to be some compromises. I think what we're really talking about today is understanding what kind of compromises you might be asked to make, whether they're fair, and whether you should be asking any questions or putting in any precautions to make sure that you're protected as much as you can be since you are being cooperative in this process. So hopefully that makes some sense. Now, some other contract concerns, as you see on your screen right now, that come up is benefits. And I mentioned that while you're furloughed, many employers will consider continue benefits. So that's something to make sure that you ask about if you agree to be furloughed. Uh, exclusivity and non-compete provisions uh, while furloughed. This is an interesting question. It's one thing if your compensation is cut and you're getting paid 50% as much and you go to the employer and you say, hey, um, you know, I, I need the money that you're not paying me. Can I pick up some hours somewhere else? Uh, some employers will say yes, some will say no. But what if you've been furloughed? And you remember furloughed means you're still employed, but you're not being paid and you have a right to apply for unemployment. This is more of a sticky situation. I have never seen a physician employment contract that allows a doctor to be furloughed. So if you've been furloughed, you've either amended your contract to agree to it, or you've ignored your contract and you've agreed to it. Uh, so there is a conversation there as to does your non-compete apply? Are 
arguably, if your contract did not allow you to be furloughed, then your employer is in breach. And it's always a good argument when the employer is in breach that a non-compete uh, has been, I don't want to say waived, but perhaps has become unenforceable due to the unclean hands of the employer as a result of a breach. So that's something definitely to talk through uh, with a lawyer to make sure that you're on the right side of it. And finally, this last point here is productivity-based compensation. I've mentioned this uh, previously, and this is a situation that is hardest right now uh, with my physicians who are paid based on productivity. And productivity can be a couple of different things. It can be a percentage of collections. It can be RVU-based compensation. So there's a couple of different ways that production-based compensation occurs. If you're paid based on production and you are not producing, then this is a difficult situation. Your employer likely has not done anything wrong. Perhaps they're even still giving you your percent of the small production you're generating. But if there are no patients, there is no production. So this is a situation where doctors are really getting hit hard if they're production-based. Now, many production-based doctors do get a guaranteed draw, which might mean an, a paycheck uh, every two weeks or every month with a reconciliation against actual production on a quarterly or annual basis. So if you're one of those physicians, you might be getting a regular paycheck. Maybe it's been cut through discussion or otherwise. But what you can expect is for that reconciliation to go through. And at the end of the year, you might actually find yourself in the negative, been overpaid by your employer because there was no production. Hopefully things will um, work out. We, we did have a few productive months at the beginning of this year. Hopefully at least elective surgeries are now back on track in many states starting next week. Uh, with some precautions, we expect to see uh, much more elective services, elective surgeries and procedures going forward. So I'm hoping most of my physicians will get back to where they were. And if they're in the negative, that it's not by too much. And that may be something that we need to help our doctors negotiate at the end of the year, given the circumstances of what's occurred here. So that's a really uh, interesting and unfortunate situation. Uh, for production-based physicians, and hopefully there's some good conversations going on on that topic between physicians and their employers. So I think that's it for the formal part of this presentation. What I really want to find out is what questions do you have that I can help you answer? Patrick, I'll turn it over to you. All right, yeah, so please, you know, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box there. Um, I received a couple um, emails already and one of them was how can you tell if your contract allows you to be furloughed or not is that written in there already well like i said i, I have yet to see a contract that specifically says i agree that i can be furloughed that just doesn't exist so if you're being furloughed you're essentially having all the other promises that are made in that contract terminated put on hold not honored however you want to say it so unless your contract says, I agree to be furloughed, then you have not agreed to be furloughed. And that is something that needs to be discussed with the employer because it, it impacts every single provision, your compensation, your benefits, perhaps, um, you know, whether you're accruing any PTO during that time, whether you're, you're uh, counting that time towards becoming a partner, if you're on partnership track. So I've never seen a contract that had that language. Now, I have... Um, on behalf of my employers, furloughed some employees. And in that case there, what we did was actually enter into a written agreement where the doctors agreed to be furloughed and they acknowledged that it was not specifically permitted, uh, permitted under their agreement and they did agree to it. So that would be the proper way to go about doing it. And what we did there was we said, um, you know, we're gonna use good faith effort to bring you back no later than X date. You agree to show up at work within seven days of being recalled. And it's important to understand that many, many practices, hospitals, surgery centers, et cetera, where the physicians who are listening here might be working, um, they have applied for PPP loans. And the PPP loans require that you bring your workforce back once you get funded. So we are expecting that once those entities get funded or within 
uh, weeks following the funding that they are going to bring their workforce back. So there is a connection timing wise between these two issues. Gotcha. Another question about being, if you are actually furloughed, um, you talked about having the non-compete in there or possibly uh, that being avoided. How, if you don't have anything in your contract about that, what's your best course of action as a provider? Should you go talk to your employer? And if they do say yes, should you be signing some type of amendment that allows you to work someplace else? Well, I guess, you know, that's, that's really interesting. You know, and I would always talk with a lawyer depending on what state you're in. But generally, a furlough is, um, you know, as I mentioned, you're, you're not being paid, but you're still employed, uh, but you can collect unemployment. So it's an awkward in-between situation. There's no great definition. You might argue that it's a breach of your contract. And in fact, in almost every case, it's a breach of your contract. So if the employer has breached your contract, can the employer enforce the provisions of your contract? When it comes to things like the non-compete, there's a lot of case law out there that makes it much easier for an employee to argue that their non-compete is not enforceable where the employer breached the contract and therefore has unclean hands. So where there's been a breach by the employer, it will be much harder for the employer to enforce a non-compete. So I think, you know, do you want to go talk to your employer about it? You certainly can. Do you want to just go start competing? Um, you know, I would talk to a lawyer before doing that. I think what's really key is what kind of future relationship do you want with your employer? If you are furloughed and you're getting your benefits paid and you're, you want to go back, I don't think competing uh, and violating that non-competing is the best approach. If, if you don't care whether you go back, if you don't think the employer really intends to bring you back, then perhaps your thinking might be different. Okay. Um, what's sort of been some of the main issues you've been seeing over the past two weeks that keep coming up with some of your clients? Well, I think the biggest issues are um, some of the ones I've mentioned where they're given amendments that are, are simply just a one-line change to their compensation um, without an end date, without any idea of whether those funds will be repaid, without any promise that they won't just be let go without cause at that new rate which will hurt them in a notice period um, without any uh, discussion of whether they can work elsewhere during that period of time, whether they could still be terminated for cause, even if they do agree to these changes uh, and are working with the employer. So most of the issues I'm seeing really relate to that. Um, and of course, you know, one of the things that's most concerning are, are really these political emails or statements that are going out where if you don't sign this, consider yourself terminated. Uh, I had another doctor recently here in Chicago who was told that um, she was going to be sent to work at a facility that had been sent up, set up for COVID patients. And um, her contract specifically said that she was going to be working at a certain location, but could be sent to other sites of the employer. And apparently this was being viewed as a site of the employer. And she was very concerned. She had young children at home, um, did not want to be exposed to COVID, wasn't, um, you know, wasn't necessarily willing to do that. And the employer had said, well, look, if you don't do it, then we consider you to be in breach. And the employer definitely had language in the contract that would allow the employee to be sent wherever the employer wanted to send the employee. And in that case there, they may have a valid ground for termination. If your contract says that you can only be you know, sent or told to work at specific locations, then that kind of approach um, is not going to work. So I think there's some other efforts being made by employers here to create for cause grounds for termination uh, so as to avoid having to pay an employee, avoid um, you know, any kind of negotiation, um, any kind of ongoing relationship where they're going to have to pay employees at all. And, you know, it's not the friendliest or nicest strategy, but that's just some examples of what I'm seeing. Interesting. I have a question going back to uh, signing an amendment, and you talked about, you know, ideally you want to try to put some type of stop date on it. So when you go back to your, your, your regular contract, say you sign one of these amendments and they don't put that date in there and things drag on and eventually elective surgeries open up. Now, ideally, most good companies are going to try to move you right back to your old contract because they want to keep you there. But say you're working for a group and they keep you on this amendment, what seems to be 
going on longer than you would expect because now you're back up to full elective surgeries, things are running the right way. At what point in, should you address this issue and how should you address it? Well, I think that's a good question. I mean, I don't, I'm don't. i not sure I know the answer to that. If you have signed an amendment that just says, I agree my compensation going forward will now be $150,000 and there's nothing in there about when it's going to go back, what the measurements are for it returning to normal uh, or anything like that, you have just amended your contract permanently. So you can go talk to the employer. You could argue that they're not acting in good faith, that they uh, should be returning you. I mean, certainly if they've returned others and not you to original compensation, then you have an even better argument. But generally, you have amended your contract. Um, and I, I think you're probably in a very difficult situation at that point. Even if you say, well, I'm not going to be treated like this, I'm going to leave, and you give your termination without cause, that's not going to change what you've now agreed to be paid. And as I've mentioned, you leaving without cause can implicate other parts in your contract. Typically, a physician who leaves without cause is going to be responsible for their tail, is going to have an enforceable non-compete, is likely going to owe back amounts that might have been advanced to them. So um, it really does create a very difficult situation um, where the employer has modified you, uh, hasn't talked to you about bringing you back to where you were or increasing you at all, hasn't made any promise to do so, doesn't appear to be making any promise to do so. Otherwise, everything appears to be back to normal. Uh, I mean, I, I, other than talking to the employer, you really don't have any legal rights at that point. You know, you could argue the employer is not acting in good faith. You detrimentally relied on their promises to return you back, but those aren't necessarily going to be winning legal arguments. Mm, that's scary stuff. So before we wrap this up, Erica, I want to give you one last chance for any final thoughts or advice you'd like to give us. Well, I think that what's really important is that you look at your contract and you understand whether you are going to be bound by changes that an employer can make without your agreement or whether all agreements must be in writing. And I think you need to know that because doctors are still getting approached every single day with amendments to their contracts or letters notifying them. So you need to know what, what is the right way and the wrong way to do this. You can then let your employer know um, I got your memo, I understand what's intended here, but my contract requires everything to be in writing. And I'm not agreeing to anything that's not in writing. Um, and then of course they'll send it to you. The question is, is it better to do that or better to just go along with a change that wasn't done properly? Do you have a better argument? Um, you know, there's different lawyers that go different ways on this. I think I can put a lot more protections into a written document. I take a chance um, if you accept a change in payment, you never argue or tell them that you don't think it complies with your contract. So when I'm given that written amendment, I feel like I can build a lot of protections in. I can build, you know, what you can't be terminated, or if you are terminated, what that's gonna look like. I can build an end date in there. So there's lots of good things about having stuff in writing. Uh, so it's something to think about. Do you want to take your chance um, with a an, an improper amendment, uh, which was done, you know, verbally or through a memo, uh, or do you want it actually in writing? And then you could think about what the pros and cons are. But I would think about getting some legal advice, even if it's just a few minutes, to kind of talk through what you're not thinking of or what you're not realizing. And then, you know, I guess one final thing I'd like to say is that your lawyer doesn't always need to be the big bad guy. So in a lot of situations, I'm not necessarily you know, marking up an amendment or rewriting it or sending nasty grams to the employer, a lot of times we're just in the background helping doctors kind of understand what the amendments are and asking, helping them ask the right questions. And very often uh, the employer will realize they didn't think about it that way or, you know, this employee is important to them and that would be more fair. So I think, you know, a lot of people sometimes are afraid that involving a lawyer is going to, um, you know, cost a lot or make them you're angry with them, but that doesn't need to be the case. I think it's really important to be well informed about your rights, to think about all the possibilities, and then at least if you're going to accept something, that you accept it knowing what's good or what's bad about the situation. Unfortunately, many doctors are not going to have a choice. If they want to keep their jobs, they're going to have to sign what the employer gave them. They're going to have to agree to whatever changes are made. And there's going to be a lot of good faith going forward that things will return to normal, that the employers will act 
uh, properly, morally, ethically, um, and keep their word that they will treat their employees fairly. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, everybody's going through a hard time right now. Uh, employers, especially uh, medical institutions and practices really are suffering quite a lot of losses. Um, physicians who have not yet started their jobs, who may have signed a contract, are already finding that their dates to start have been pushed back. I had a physician yesterday who was told that her, um, her contract or compensation would only be honored for the first 90 days. And after that, she could expect at least a 10% cut but that she would be treated the same as everybody else. So it's really a tough situation even for physicians coming out of training this summer who are taking their first jobs. Everybody's being impacted by this. And I think we have to look at the big picture, try and do things as fairly as we can, treat each other the best way we can, but we also have to be aware of our rights. And I think sometimes employers are assuming that you don't know or you won't ask and they do take advantage of doctors. So you know, be forewarned, be aware, and ask the right questions. No, it's all great information, Erica. We really appreciate it. And I just want to thank everybody that's out there who joined us. I hope you're staying safe. Um, we're looking forward to seeing you guys back in the ORs if you're not there already. If you do have any questions, you know, feel free to leave them in the, uh, the show notes. Uh, we'll also be leaving Erica's information in there so you can contact her. She's a great resource, a great person to talk to. Um, outside of that, once again, thank you very much. Make sure to visit bagmass.com, and we'll see you soon. Take care.